Ben Teitelbaum, thank you so much for agreeing to speak with me on the Real Clear Values podcast. It's a pleasure to be with you, Tom. Ben, I was absolutely riveted by your recent book, or fairly recent book, War for Eternity, which features some very interesting characters and a very interesting plot, which kind of moves around in different places. I have to ask, as the, the opening question, how does a professor of musicology end up chasing around the globe to talk to people like Steve Bannon, Alexander Dugan and various others? My first response would be that it's happenstance, coincidence yeah. and accident. But the more sincere response actually, Tom, is, is I don't think it is. We, especially people who are either academics in the social sciences or if you're kind of a political science junkie type, we distinguish between what we think are kind of the serious moves and behaviors of life, policy, um, you know, official electoral politics and things like that. And then the, and then the unserious stuff, mm. art, entertainment, and we typically put music in that, in that latter category. I don't think it belongs there. And, and some very serious political strategists don't think it belongs there either. Mm. I think that some of the most consequential, influential aspects of social behavior take place in that soft culture area <clears throat> through media like like music mm -hmm. and so the fact that I've been studying music for such a long time in my case has meant practically speaking that I've actually gotten a lot of access to people who I wouldn't have gotten access to and people think no I'm a music scholar instead of a political scientist mm -hmm. they're far more uh, open to speaking with me often yeah but also it, it means that you're you're getting a lot of exposure to people's ideals yes. uh, in things like music and things like art, theater, and so on, you will see a presentation of a vision and sometimes mm. in more color than, than what would come out in a, in a policy proposal or something like that. Mm. So, so uh, to, that's a long answer to your question, but I think that actually years of studying music qualify me quite well to be, to be doing this type of work. Yeah, absolutely. And that really comes out in, in the book itself. And that, that's why when I, I didn't actually read your full bio before I started reading the book. And when I saw retrospectively that, you know, having started the book, that you were a professor of music college, so I thought, wow, this is a really interesting connection. And what you said there really resonates with me about values and ideals through music, because I personally have been involved in a, a, an amateur level, just with bands and messing about with friends and writing music. And, and I can see, I know exactly what you're talking about, where you say, that somebody's values and ideals and what it is that they're striving for or what it is that they're suffering or what they feel that they're suffering with as well. It just comes into the music and it's expressed in a way that just doesn't get articulated in, in a so-called rational sense. Absolutely. I mean, I think in some ways what we're talking about or what you were expanding to, to speak about there is what is sometimes called positionality that, mm. that you see in expressive culture not just even an agenda or a vision, like what I was mentioning before, but really somebody understanding themselves in a context and saying, mm. okay, this is what it feels like to be me in this place and in this time with mm. what I am yearning toward and what I am fearing um, all at the same moment. We, I think that we get more vivid portrayals of that when we don't feel we have to be so specific as, as writing a document or something. We get more vivid portrayals of it if, if we are um, trafficking in style and, and yeah. somewhat more tangible expression. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, totally agree. And, and, and on that point, I have to ask you about, I have to ask you about Sweden and music and the far right. How, how did all these things come together for you in your own story? Uh, this, this was somewhat coincidental in that, in that I was very interested in studying Sweden. I've been interested in Sweden since I was very young. My mother's family is Swedish. And I, as a, as a graduate student, went to Sweden to study Swedish folk music, which is something that I play for them as well. And I was interested in studying some, some of the more eccentric uh, rhythmic patterns in certain branches of Swedish folk music. So extremely narrow, right? Very pedantic mm -hmm. sort of work. Um, while I was there, a far right party, the Sweden Democrats, come into power. One of their initial moves, proposals, is to increase funding to Swedish folk music, of all things. Everyone was expecting them to just constantly be a sort of broken record on immigration, trade sometimes. But they come out and start wanting to speak about culture, and they say, we also need to support Swedish folk, folk culture. Mm 
And that started a huge public debate. And I thought, no, this is what I need to be doing. This is far more interesting. Um, and at least it'd be interesting to other people. And so I, I started studying that and there, there was, and I didn't know this at the time, but there was, there's a lot about Sweden's far right that makes the study of music interesting. Mm. Uh, if you followed European politics, especially you know, for throughout the past decades, you've probably once upon a time thought of Sweden as being the country that was immune to right-wing populism. Mm. Right, you saw all these other countries getting their own kind of fringe party with some minor representation in parliament, but Sweden had it, had avoided that, and and that that's was key to Sweden's reputation as being this liberal bastion. Mm -hmm. Under the surface, however, Sweden had one of the largest white power music scenes in the world, mm -hmm. and per capita, you know, it's not the sort of thing we can study and quantify, but probably per capita, it probably had more white power bands than any other country on earth. Mm -hmm. um, certainly had considerably more than all of its its Nordic neighbors combined, and and so this is always music was always important there, and it played it had an interesting role to play um, a sort of reverse relationship to parliamentary and electoral success. Mm -hmm. So studying music for me, and also watching music decline in Sweden, actually as electoral opportunities started to emerge for the far right in that country it it allowed it allowed for much bigger conversations actually about you know what do fringe political movements do what is the role of music and expressive culture in their activism if you can't actually gain formal political power and so you gain symbolic power through music all of those things made made sweden a very rich uh topic uh, mm -hmm. to study Mm, very interesting. And ju just to be explicit on this point, Ben, what is it that, that these folks really want to gain from promoting Swedish folk music in, in relation to promoting nationalism in the general populace? Well, it, it was complicated um, because on the one hand, they, and this seemed pretty obvious to, to people, spectators, that, okay, they wanted to use folk music to reinforce and accentuate the idea of Swedish distinctiveness and that... Mm. The Swedish population was united internally by, by a certain heritage and a legacy um, and distinguished externally from others who had different legacies and, and mm. heritage. So it was a way of, of, of rein, attempting to reinforce the national sentiment. But that's kind of just the, the surface level. The, the deeper story that interested me more was that folk music was also a way for these this wing of the far right to signal to itself and to others that it was not part of the old far right. Mm. The old far right that was principally defined by skinhead mm -hmm. uh, music style persona as, as well. Mm. Um, a revolutionary, uncompromising, idealistic, decadent, underground, ineffectual, brutish, hooliganistic uh, far right. This, this, new, uh, this new wave that is very much part of the populist wave that sweeps across the world was trying to say we're different from that and using mm -hmm. more wholesome, um, less, less offensive, but also, also more, let's say, authentically Swedish music was part of that campaign. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting, it's a very interesting tactic and it's very, it's, especially since it's so indirect as well, because Politics is, is a, a lot of politics is about expediency. And this is part of the problem we have when we're trying to look at bigger picture problems and problems that take longer than a four year term limit to deal with because everything needs to be done now. Whereas this seems like a very long term approach. 100%. In fact, that the ideologues who were behind this, who really had thought about all this, they, in fact, one of them I, I wrote quite a bit about in my book, you know, he has even said to me, yeah, I'm a politician, I'm glad we're represented in parliament, but this longer campaign is what is, is what's key here. What we need to do is change common sense in Sweden. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if we don't do that, then it, you know, all of our electoral gains are not going to matter at all. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that tactic, what he was referring to there was metapolitics. Yeah. Um, it's a concept I've written about in a number of sources, including my most recent book, but it's it's a far right um, borrowing of Antonio Gramsci. Um, in many cases, a simplification of Gramsci, it must be said. Mm. But the belief that that the the most enduring and impactful form of power is the power that rests that does not need coercion behind it. 
Mm. Um, it's when a population follows a directive because they think it is common sense. Yes. Um, you know, as opposed to following a directive because there is the threat of force behind it. If you get the former rather than the latter, that's going to be more enduring. And politics are not going, electoral politics are not going to shape it. They're going to reflect mm -hmm. and respond to it. So that's where you want to get. Yeah. So absolutely, absolutely. That is what's going on. And it's it's more theorized and explicit, I think, than people might realize. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's very interesting. And it seems very much, it seems almost like a Trojan horse in some respects, because who, who's going to argue about the traditional music of a nation? It's not... It's not necessarily fascistic or. No, and even 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 the initial conclusions of it are not. I, I, I would hope that they would not be controversial. I mean, there are, Swedes do have some collective culture and, and there is such a thing as as not always inherited, but at least um, imagined inherited uh, legacies and heritage and things like that. Mm. So if you're just at those opening stages, you aren't dealing with anything that incendiary, mm. right? Mm. The, the, the first is explicitly uh, wholesome. And, and those, those, the following conclusions are slightly more controversial, but, but not to that broad a swath of people. Certainly not, mm. uh, it's not as though they're only going to appeal to people susceptible to far right messaging and propaganda. Mm. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. I have, to, I have to ask this question, Ben, because you you must have put yourself in some pretty dangerous situations or situations that many of of us just on the street would would see as dangerous situations have you have you felt that that's the case in the course of your research have you, have you ever felt like you you're entering into unsafe territory and, and if so how have you managed that a couple times um the ways that i've always managed it therein in life in general is to make as much noise as i possibly can <laughs> um, also don't never misrepresent myself hmm. uh, so that you never end up in a situation where you, where you have a social context or let's say a support network or a safety, uh, a safety net that isn't fully aware of who you are and what you're doing. Hmm. Um, so that, you know, that, that involves not getting on people's bad side too much by lying to them. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it means it means also that uh, I think some of the relationships that I've formed in the field, even with with insiders who I'm studying, mm. um, they've they've been on pretty solid grounds. And mm. there was, for for example, there was one instance where I felt pretty threatened by someone within a scene in Scandinavia, and it actually was kind of nice to not to, to be able to call on people within the scene and say. I'm I'm afraid of this guy. Can you keep an eye on this for me? Mm. Please let me know if if there's something that I need to be paying attention to. I'm not interested in taking any any gigantic risks with my with my safety. Yeah. Um, and knowing that I I could kind of count on those relationships was pretty good. And that that starts mm. with honesty and transparency in the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think I think that must give you a real sense of satisfaction in the work that you're doing and the integrity that you have in doing that work in that you're not trying to hoodwink people you're not trying to lie to people and i think i think there's a very transcendent human quality about that about trust like you say where you're going in there you're saying up front who you are why you're there what you, your purposes are and they choose whether to accept you into that and and so in a way it seems as though they've accepted you into the group they, they said right you can come into our group and we can have these conversations you can have these experiences and that means that everyone within that group has to be cool with you and treat you with respect and that and it's not that that's problem free of course sure. uh, there, there are there are all sorts of of conscious and, and, and unconscious uh, you know what should i say uh you know, manipulations that can take place. That seems a little bit of a heavy-handed word, but I, mm. so as not to seem like I'm being euphemistic, but we can use that term. Mm -hmm. um, that that can be there, but in the grand scheme of things, I, I don't think that we are quite as as vulnerable to manipulation um, as we think we are. And I and I feel that way about my readers as well. I think mm. that if you lay things out, um, if you let people know what your relationships were with the people, then that you're studying and that you're writing about, they can make informed uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, decisions and and can draw informed conclusions about it. The, 
a couple important things about that for me though, about, about being open and honest. One is that it, it goes a long ways to helping you maintain a long-term relationship. Hmm. I could in certain sectors um, go into a far right society, circle scene, um, infiltrate it, have, you know, revealing conversations with people and then leave and write my expose and burn them all. And, and that would be great. What people don't realize is that my insights will probably suffer because of that. Mm, you yeah. don't, you need to have a long-term exchange with people. You need to be able to, let's say, write something about somebody, hear their criticisms about it, and decide what you, what you make of their criticisms. Yeah. Um, that, that, that takes time. There's also an ethical issue of, of destroying opportunities for other researchers mm -hmm. too. Absolutely. Every time, every time a scholar does that, that's an additional sector probably of this, this movement and this scene that we all need desperate insight into that becomes more closed, more difficult to learn about. So, so it's, it's also about showing some respect to fellow, fellow commentators, researchers, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, I think that's an extremely if I may say so, I, th I think that's an extremely mature approach to take because I have in, in my own in my own studies, I, I, I have a, a half humanities, half social science background. But in my in my social science background, I have come across those sorts of, of piece of research that have been. I'm going to be the mole. I'm going to be undercover. I'm going to get all this great information and bang, I'm going to expose it. And y yeah. you left feeling a little bit uncomfortable afterwards because you think, well, Where's the integrity in that? Where's the honor in, in that? Because you've, you've spoken to all these people on a false premise and yes. essentially lied to them. And then, you know, it's like, it's like, that, it's like that age old question, isn't it? If, if a human being sees that, that a human being is lied to another human being, then what's to say they're not gonna lie to them? So the entire integrity of the operation is compromised. Absolutely. And I, I will, I'll accept the compliments because I get a lot of crap for this too, so. <laughs> No, no, I, I'm, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to hear that. It, and it's not just, I'm with you, Tom, in that that kind of bothers me morally, socially. Um, but if, if that doesn't bother someone, then let them be bothered by the intellectual consequences of it, which you're starting to get mm. into, mm. which is you start this, there, there's a reason why scholars in almost every other field of almost any other population do not do this. That's because mm. they think it gives them bad data, for lack of mm -hmm. a better term is that you can't sustain these relationships long-term over publications, let's say, which is usually vital for a scholar. Mm. Um, and if, if that brand of distrust enters the relationship, then, then the statements that are made and, and the, the exposure and the access that is granted is all compromised. Yes. And that, that compromises your, the, the facts that you are going to collect, no yeah. doubt. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's speak then, a little bit to your to your intentions what what really comes across when when i read the acknowledgements in war for eternity ben is the sense of urgency that you had in writing this book because you wrote it very quickly quite rapidly and, and it doesn't come out it didn't come out should i say that long after your previous book lions of the north so so what was your where did the sense of urgency come from in your writing the book it was discovering that there were conversations, relationships, attempted actions, at least that were taking that were taking place right now, um, that it did not seem to me, it still doesn't, excuse me, that that any other outsider was aware of, mm -hmm. um, at, at least at least in the terms, at least in the details of what was going on, and so it, it was a new in ways that other other pieces of research. Um, I've been working on were not. And it ended up being more of a news item in Brazil um, that has to do with kind of the political fortunes of the, of the people I was studying. But um, when I realized that, you know, these, these actors that I was, I was interested in that they were actually attempting to coordinate with each other. And that mm. at least in one case, it had a link to, you know, the formal leader of a large, powerful nation, namely Brazil, um, then to me, the imperative to move on this quickly became, uh, became more binding. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very interesting. And it's interesting that you've been able to make that, that connection as well. So, so let's talk about something that, 
that brings these kind of characters together because the characters that you talk about in the book I'd say I'd say is it fair to say that the, the three main ones would be Steve Bannon, Alexander Dugin and Olavo de Cavallo these are three fairly would you say these are three fairly disparate characters because I think I mean I think about um, Bannon and Dugin for example you've, you've got Steve Bannon who is Trump's guy he's you know the the, the top brain behind Trump and then Alexander Dugin, who is really part of Russia's annexation efforts, how how does traditionalism, or, or, or should I say, I'm, I think I'm getting ahead of myself here, tell us a little bit about traditionalism and how it does bring these characters together. Sure, sure. The first question you were talking about is very interesting too, but we'll, we'll, we'll start with traditionalism. So, um, so traditionalism is is a, a sort of belief system or at least a narrative of human history that those three characters share an affiliation with in different ways, albeit. But um, in its right-wing version, some of its key ideas are that time, was, time is cyclical. Hmm. Um, and this is an idea that it, it borrows or observes in Hinduism, this belief hmm. that human societies are moving through principally four eras. Uh, for time periods that, that progressively decline, uh, that you begin with a golden age, you move to a silver age, to a bronze age, and finally to a dark age. After which, at the end of a dark age, there's a cataclysmic event, a collapse of sorts, and a rebirth into a golden age, and so on and mm. so forth. And uh, traditionalists also tend to, to specify what it is that makes a golden age golden and a dark age dark. And that's where you start to see reactionary politics becoming a little bit more, more illuminated, especially if you're talking about traditionalism, the brand of a, of a thinker named Julius Evola. Mm -hmm. So what, what tends to make a golden age golden in their, in their eyes is uh, social stratification in borders within society, order mm -hmm. in other ways, um, that can manifest principally in terms of a hierarchy, a caste hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Um, where different different social castes are are seen as being permanently and authentically separate from one another and having separate destinies, um, mm. but that principle of borders can be taken out of that that vertical plane and applied in different ways. Typically, traditionalists have looked at the approach of the Dark Age as being heralded by a loss of all types of borders, um, mm. not just social hierarchy, but it could be national borders, it could be globalization at the hands of democracy or communism or something like that. Um, and, and finally, uh, when they look at, let's say a hierarchy, they also tend to see the upper caste and observe this from Hinduism as being a spiritual elite, mm. uh, valuing the immaterial opposite, a slave caste that values the material um, right. that is focused on goods and bodies. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for Julius Evola also, that spiritual elite also aligned with an Aryan racial identity, opposite mm. a non-Aryan racial identity or a Semitic racial identity that he saw as being associated with materialism. Mm. So to wrap all that together uh, in, in that Evolian traditionalist variant, you would look at the Dark Ages, if you believed in this time cycle um, belief, you would look at the Dark Ages as a time when borders evaporate, um, when social hierarchies come collapsing down, and then by the way, they always collapse down, they don't collapse up. Um, collapsing down to the lowest level uh, and, and where the values of materialism, goods, money, bodies, and, uh, and the racial identity of non-Aryans uh, start to spread across the world. And, mm. and you see a loss of differentiation in general, you see a loss of spiritual values, and you see a loss of Aryan distinctiveness. Um, Evola elaborated that as well and, and injected ideas about masculinity opposite femininity um, in that. But that's, that's where political traditionalism starts to get its signatures is when you see the overlapping of these associations, borderlessness, um, uh, let's, you know, uh, a lack of, of hierarchy, materiality, lack of, of Aryan uh, and masculine distinctiveness mm -hmm. in society. So, so that's, that's its, its variant in these thinkers in various ways, you know, very few of them, let's say Steve Bannon, Dugan, Olavo, very few of them take that, that account just at face value. Mm -hmm. um, they, they vary it or there are things that they like and they don't like, 
Uh, but that the if you look at traditionalism aligned with right wing politics, that's its most archetypical form. That is then yeah. varied by various thinkers. Yeah, yeah. It's this is so interesting, and and I have to say, just along this line, you, you talk about borderlessness and borderlessness as a as a real problem and a, and a sign of of degeneration or collapse. And one of the first things that comes to mind is Nietzsche when you talk about that, and and the parable of the madman when he talks about these borderless horizons, and yes. And, and I was really surprised, actually, and I'm not saying he necessarily should be there, but, but there's a, a, a paucity of Nietzsche within your book. Um, but, but, but sh- it probably yeah. should be there. Yeah. I mean, I mean just, just to ask you, I'm not, I'm not, again, I'm not saying that he should be there, but, but in terms yeah. of his influence on, on traditionalism and certainly someone like Evola, would you say that, that Nietzsche has influenced the, the traditionalists or traditionalist thinking? Certainly Evola. Yes, mm. um, there. In, in, in fact, Evola makes use of, of Nietzsche in a number of his writings, um, and and it, it's a, this is the thing with Nietzsche, of course, that he's everywhere. Mm. Right? There's mm. so many different political interests that can that can find find justifications for him. Um, Evola referred to Nietzsche both in prior to the fall of Mussolini in World War World War Two. And after, and almost used Nietzsche in both ways, Evola was very different before when he was thinking that human ingenuity and the strength of will could in fact reverse the time cycle that mm. he observed. And afterwards, he's more fatalistic and says, you know, no, we were destined to go through the dark age. And he, he quotes Nietzsche in one very famous moment um, in saying, you know, the desert encroaches, woe to him in whom deserts reside. Mm. Uh, in other words of saying okay the dark age is coming it's going to envelop society but the dark age doesn't have to live within me right and right. that's that's the extent of the arena that i you know that, that a human being could uh you know could preserve some sort of anti-modern ideal so mm-hmm. nietzsche is there the other thing to note about nietzsche is 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 his interest alongside the traditionalists in the indo-european question Mm-hmm. Of course, and analyzing social structures in, in in that way. So, even if even in those instances where they're not citing each other per se, they're both working in some cases with some with some similar source material. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And just just sticking with this point about decline, and and in relation to to caste as well, there's something that I'd like to pick up on the the spiritual aspect of that because I think most people understand what caste means in the relation to the color of somebody's skin. I ex- I experienced it when. I lived in in Madagascar. I, I was a, a Mormon missionary for two years in Madagascar. And when you're there, when you're in a place for that long, you get talking to people and they tell you the deeper things about the culture and they tell you, well, actually, yeah, you you see all these people speaking the same language. And this is how it really is. This is this is what it means for somebody who's got darker skin, who's got lighter skin, et cetera, et cetera. So I think a lot of people understand what caste means in that context. But what what do these divisions mean from a spiritual point of view? I know in the book you write about warriors, priests, merchants, etc. Who who are these different types of of people, and and how do they fit into the kind of hierarchy, so to speak? So so this hierarchy, again borrowed and, and somewhat simplified from Hinduism, observes really four castes: priests on top, followed by warriors, followed by merchants, and finally slaves, and in that ordering, yes, there's there's a broad opposition between spiritualism and and, and materialism. Um, we see it even with warriors uh, that you know in this conception, what makes a warrior a warrior authentically is that they fight for an ideal of honor, and honor is is essentially an immaterial entity, and that that makes them you know pulls them out of the material realm. Um, you get to merchants, and at least they're pursuing something beyond themselves, mm. um, and money primarily. And finally, you get to slaves, and and material becomes the, the primary, ultimate materiality, which is the body. Mm. Right? Either they're consumed with sex, or the, or or it's just physical physical labor and and quantity that is is really the the lens through which they view themselves and the world. Um, the the priestly caste is. In, in these original understandings, it's almost always necessarily small. Mm-hmm. So it has to be an elite and it has to be separate. Um, right. And in some cases, Evola elaborated on that to say that these, you know, a priestly disposition uh, is, is pointed up to the sky. Um, we can tell that priests are authentic priests if they worship the sun, 
um, in particular, and and if their nature is such that it it radiates rather um, than than other let's say other natural metaphors. So so those are the those those are some things. But it is it is the worship and the devotion to a principle or an ideal that is not just outside of themselves but is extra human that yeah. makes makes someone a priest and distinguishes them from a warrior. Mm. That's really interesting. That that point that you make about how that there can only be so many priests resonates actually, and it interests me because if I if I recall correctly, at one point in the in the book, you mentioned that Steve Bannon believes that everybody should be a priest. So is he wrong on that then, according to traditionalism, or is that one of the things that he's taken from traditionalism and and made it his own? It's certainly one of the things that he is he is uh, modified from traditionalism. I mean, I think part of the challenge for him, if you think about everything that I've talked about thus far about traditionalism, imagine trying to fit that with uh, American nationalism, hmm. Enlightenment era, liberal democratic, libertarian values. In, in some ways, they're polar opposites hmm. uh, from one another. So, it, and that is a lot of what Steve Bannon wanted to do. He clearly, I think if you look at his biography, he's had more consistent interest in this body of literature, traditionalism or alternative spirituality than just about anything else in his career and his life uh, with mm. the exception of Catholicism, which, which in some ways that we could talk about met, melds with traditionalism. Mm. Um, so, so he, he feels some allegiance to it. He also feels an allegiance to American nationalism and some of those principles. So the idea of social mobility, which is so ingrained in, in the U S psyche, um, the idea of openness and the, and the uh, availability to all of, of, of social mobility. Those were things I think he did not want to, to lose. And so he comes up with this other idea where you still have the same ordering of values, let's say, mm -hmm. the same hierarchy um, and, and, and sort of distinct separateness of different, of different castes. But he believes that um, people can and should aspire to all become priests and to to essentially mm. climb that hierarchy throughout their life. Yeah, that's really interesting. The idea of of progression, and this is something that is found in a lot of a lot of religions. Like I say, from my own experience with Mormonism, one of the most one I, one of the most appealing things that I find in that is the idea of eternal progression. The idea that that we can always improve, that we can always get better, and and it's one of the things that that Mormons get absolutely slaughtered for from other Christians, the idea that um, that man can become God or, or become yes. can become like God, but but in a more day to day sense of things, it gives you a, a distinct sense of of moving forwards. Of you know, I, I have no idea what it would be yes. like to be a God or anything like that, and that's not something I think about on a regular basis. But I do think about getting better, just one step at a time on a daily basis, and and having that trajectory can can be a really powerful and empowering thing. So I, I can understand how that. That appeals to a lot of people, um, notwithstanding the fact that, that, like you say, it's it's one of those things that is obviously in, in traditionalism it, it's couched within that that quite specific category system and, and hierarchy. And so, if everybody's if everybody's a priest, then then nobody's a priest, or the, the value right. of a priest is is diminished, right? And and the idea and and the the underlying the principle of mobility is not mm. something that traditionalism, that orthodox version of traditionalism values that much. Mm. It's, it's, it's so much more actually about learning to find one's place and also coming in contact with principles that are not mobile, that are not changing. Mm. That's part of the idea. And one of the reasons I call the book War for Eternity is that they, they see themselves as fighting on behalf of the eternal value opposite progress. Mm. Which, which is here understood as a liberal value, um, a yeah. modern value opposite an anti-modernist traditionalist value. So ab ab absolutely. And, and th there, I'm sure there is scholarship somewhere on Mormonism that talks about the, you know, the Americanness of Mormonism, the, you know, mm. the, the resonances between that and the society where Joseph Smith lived, that this idea of self-improvement this idea mm -hmm. of change and yearning always to be something better than what you were born into. You know, th those, are, those are powerful ideas for American society. Mm -hmm. um, at large, we could imagine, and there are plenty of other religious teachings that would conflict with core American values more than that. Yeah, um, yeah. So a little side note, I mean, I, I, did I write about, 
I can't remember, if he, you know, I've, I've had conversations with Steve about Joseph Smith before. Yes, you meant, I was going to ask you about that. You mentioned that in the book, and, and I thought that was a fascinating anecdote, how, how he said that he didn't believe that, that he could have made it all up on his own without divine intervention. I, I was going to ask you about that, actually, to, to maybe elaborate on, yes. on, on his thoughts on that. He, he and he didn't elaborate much, but he just it, it was it was almost the, the way that he said it. We had that conversation at dinner. Uh, he, he said it as though he was speaking to a skeptic that you know he didn't like mm. everybody who made fun of Mormons um, mm. and thought that Joseph Smith was a fraud because it just was not possible in his mind that Joseph Smith made all that up. He mm. thinks that there was some sort of divine presence in him. And to, to me, there, I mean, there are a couple of things to draw from that. Uh, one is, is that this relates to traditionalism. We haven't talked about the justifications for traditionalism, but it, they typically think um, that the tradition, uh, the namesake of, of, of the doctrine uh, is something that predates all of the religions that we see in the world today. And mm -hmm. that it's truths which were splintered and forgotten still exist and live in different religions. Mm -hmm. And that means for a lot of followers of it that you can devote yourself and perhaps you should devote yourself fully to one faith and one faith practice and try and advance through it. But you can't say that that faith practice has a monopoly on all spiritual truths and you have mm -hmm. to be open and aware and, and, and you typically accept the notion um, as Steve Bannon does that let's say the Bible does not is not the final and complete word. Mm -hmm. um, and that you can look to Sufism, you can look to Hinduism, you can look to Mormonism, Judaism, mm -hmm. Buddhism, um, and, and believe that they all have traces of, of a once complete and integrated religious teaching in the past. Mm -hmm. So, so in, in a way, what he had to say about Joseph Smith was not, is not surprising at all. I just, I'm not aware of other traditionalists who have accepted Mormonism as being in some way part of the mm -hmm. tradition. Yeah. Um, but but that's, that's the instinct that it comes from. Yeah, very interesting. And it's a very interesting point that he made, he made in that regard, because obviously it's, um, it's, it's relatively, yes, it's, it's been noted for the speed of its growth, but, but it's a relatively small religion in, in global terms. So, so yeah, that, that is quite interesting. It's also interesting in terms of, you know, how he, how he sees these things fitting together as well, because I think, I think about, I think about something like Mormonism, and I think there's a similarity in that where, I, th I think Mormons today, and, and I don't want to speak on anyone else's behalf, but I think there's a tendency to think that we've kind of got what we've got in terms of our doctrine, in terms of our scripture. But when the, the more I look at, at Joseph Smith's teachings and things that were said about other areas as well, and certainly if you look at the parallels between Mormonism and various other things and various other influences, the idea was from the start to kind of go out and get truth wherever it might be found and and look at these things on a principled basis so so from what they would you know i say they being the founders of mormonism they would have been in agreement with going to say hinduism or other religions and, and actually looking at the principles that are being taught there and seeing actually that there's value in that there's validity in those things and it's not just a case of this is a closed shop and we only look at at what we've got here interesting i i haven't really learned about that aspect of it. I'm, I've known that culturally, for, for example, kirtan singing, there's a lot of Hindu um, or even Hare Krishna, there's, there's, there are a lot of, of Hindu cultural practices that are very strong in Utah. Mm, right. In States. And this is not because there, there's some, some abundance of observing Hindus living there, but th these, these are Mormons who are practicing um, mm. you know, practicing this music in, in, in the case that I'm most familiar with. But ab absolutely, and, and also accepting the idea that the world we live in today, here and now, is spiritually infused and, and, mm. and, and enchanted, that, that mystic um, assumption or dis, uh, disposition Yes, that, that I think at, at least Mormonism has had in, till recently, quite recently, still today. <laughs> you have to, I'm not an expert on it, but, but sure. more recently, that say, than, than a lot of branches of Christianity, that too is uh, should receive a lot of endorsement from traditionalism because the, part mm -hmm. of their idea is that the belief in a disenchanted world, um, the death of God is a hallmark of the dark age, mm -hmm. right? That we've gone through, we've seen the loss of spirituality uh, in route to a borderless, materialistic leveled world. Um, and, and that we've also that therefore 
you know, cease to think about our surroundings and ourselves as being anything other than just pure material. Mm. Interesting. So not that I'm trying to promote traditionalism. No, no. <laughs> These aspects of traditionalism, it must be said also, are not, are not inherently tied to right-wing politics. Yes. Um, it's only through, through certain thinkers uh, that they have been in certain ways. Yes, and, and that and that's the interesting point, isn't it? And and this is this is this is the thing with any of these things. It's, it's the thing with the, the Bible itself. You know, it's been used to justify all sorts of atrocities, but also it's it's been empowering to people who read it in an entirely different way, to yes. help them to to raise their standards, to raise their sights to Christ. And so, yes. I find it I find it's very indicative of the values of the individual and how they apply these things more than the thing itself in some respects. The thing itself isn't necessarily saying go out and do X, Y, and Z, but it can inspire within certain people certain actions and behaviors. Absolutely, and, and we should bear in mind too that people say that they will follow some certain thing and then do something entirely different. Sure. Uh, people are, as long as hypocrisy has existed and will continue to exist, we should never speak about logical social consequences mm. or written words or even professed doctrines because people mm. will take these doctrines for uh, any number of reasons and do any number of things with them. Um, we've been talking about Steve Bannon's modifications of traditionalism. Some of those are in the eyes of some people, wholly oxymoronic. Yeah. Uh, they, they should not, no way can you speak about a populist traditionalism where you want to have a massive people, you know, going into some, you know, doing some, something collectively in the, you know, transcending boundaries and things like that. Mm. And for some people that, that, that's the end of the story at that point. For me, I don't, one reason I don't get too excited about that is I think it's more the, the standard than the exception for people to do what they want to do with ideas. Yeah. And it, there's a role for academics and historians to kind of police ideological communities and go in and say, okay, now you have stopped being a part of this, this stream of ideas. But for me, mm. as, as, a, as a more of an anthropologist, sociologist, who, who wants to follow what people are doing on the ground and let that be the guide, you back off and, and see what people will do with these, with these uh, labels, with these schools, with these communities. They will stretch the boundaries in any way that they mm. want to. Yeah, so. it's amazing. It's amazing. It reminds me of that. Ideas together in any way that they want to. Absolutely. It reminds me of that. Emerson. I think it was Emerson who said, I cannot hear what you're saying because what you're doing is shouting so loudly in my ears or something to that effect. I'm ad-libbing ad it. There, yeah, but. Yes, but it sounds, sounds like a very similar idea. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Just sticking with, with spirituality in relation to traditionalism for a moment, Ben. I'm interested, and, and my sense is that this does apply to the traditionalists that you've been speaking about, such as Evola and certainly Dugan as well you mentioned in the book there seems to be this fascination with black magic and the occult and Dugan's use of the chaos symbol as well what what's that all about the the particulars of that is, is really not something that I can I can speak to hmm. um, but in general the, I mean the, the way to make political sense of it if, if, the, if that can be the way that I take your your question Mm -hmm. um, is is a belief in alternative sources of knowledge and of power mm. um, as a sort of pretext also for rejecting the established methods of knowledge and power. If that is science, mm. um, if it is physics, if it is a political establishment. Mm. Um, I think the attraction of, of magic to these, these, these actors, especially latter-day traditionalists like Dugan, and, and their populist affiliators is that it's, it's, a, it's part and parcel for saying everything that the establishment, that the system is teaching us is wrong. And we, we have our own ways of learning about the world and of affecting the world. Mm. Um, and so esotericism, mysticism, and, and practices of, of black magic um, are part of that. Yeah, Absolutely. it's really, I mean, it, I, I, yeah. I was, I, you know, when you, when you hear people hear black magic, they think about some sort of satanic um, incarnation, and there's that too. But in a, a lot of its 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 incarnations, 
it's really about attempting to change the course of events and the behaviors of people in the here and now. Yeah. That's yeah. more about, about what, what, what some of its main, it's, it's broader kind of thrust is at the moment. So, so that's why, you know, in responding to your question, I'm, I'm apt to look at it in, in the, through the lens actually of anti-establishment populism, which people yes. might not associate with, with magic, but yeah. um, if you think of coal miners and, you know, or disgruntled uh, harbor, laborers in Blackpool or something like that voting for Brexit, you typically do not imagine them in sequined gowns practicing magic or something, but is, there is a conceptual link between the two of them. Mm, mm. And yeah, as, as a, of, of established methods of established media, science, you know, universities and political establishments. Mm, mm, very interesting. Where's, uh, where's Carl Jung when you need him? He'd, he'd, be, uh, <laughs> he'd be interesting to talk to about this perhaps. Um, <laughs> Just, just going back to Steve Bannon then, Ben, I'm interested to talk a little bit about his spiritual journey because in, in your book, I, and, and I love the way you've written the book because it, it reads, I think it's the, the, in the FT, art, the FT review of your book, it, it says specifically that your book reads like a Dan Brown novel and it very much does. Mm -hmm. And I love the way that you tell the story of Steve Bannon as this young man who's on a, who's on a, boat in the south china sea that's got nuclear weapons on board and then he's checking out metaphysical bookshops and things like that tell us a little bit about where you know what what is it that what is it that attracts bannon to this sort of thing in the first place where does he think actually what i've got in catholicism isn't doing it for me the world is not as it should be i'm going to look for something else and he's looking, you know, this is retrospectively, so so take it with a grain of salt. Sure. But he looks back, said that when he even when he was young, that he found the Catholic Church to be okay, and part of his it's almost a, a sort of ethnic identity for him, growing up in Richmond, Virginia, but that it lacked a sort of spiritual core. He, you can never really put it into words for me. I wanted to put the quote in my book. My editor made me take it out, but you ah. know, he sat and rambled for a long period of time when he was saying, you know, the, the Catholic mass singing in the choir, it didn't have that, that uh, crystallization. It didn't have that, uh, that thing, you know, that, uh, but he is something about it was vapid. It was spiritually vapid to him. He understood it as, mm. as, as a sort of, battery of moral moral directives mm -hmm. uh, that he also seemed when he described that to me he also seemed moral directives that he didn't particularly like that much right uh, you know the, thinking of the book of matthew and, and and the sissy jesus that you know he was much more into jesus the exorcist but but that right. wasn't emphasized um mm -hmm. you know jesus doing a, a sort of spiritual uh, as a sort of spiritual warrior um, so, so there was an empty spot there and in college, you know, he, he comes of age at a time when a lot of young men in the U S especially young white men, uh, were getting into Buddhism mm. and he starts practicing meditation and that, you know, that he starts reading, uh, a lot. And he, he's always been quite a reader. Everyone knows that about him. Even his critics will admit that, that he, he, as, a, as quite a breadth of, of knowledge when it comes to literature. And early on, what he would describe to me was, was going into really, really seeking out new age, metaphysical, alternative spirituality bookstores, mm -hmm. and just plowing through everything he could and that he wanted the toughest stuff. He wanted the, mm -hmm. the densest, most richly researched material. He didn't want, you know, meditation for dummies. He wanted mm -hmm. Madame Blavatsky's you know, secrets of ISIS, the, the, really that, 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 the heavy, heavy literature. Um, and he discovers traditionalism somehow in that context. And it starts with Ganon, he says, and he migrates from Ganon to, uh, to other authors, eventually to Evola, finally to Dugan, you know, he moves in a more political direction eventually, but he was reading, reading just the pure spiritual text early on. Um, but for a long period of time, it wasn't traditionalism that was his foremost interest. It was a, a related, adjacent thinker named uh, uh, George Gurdjieff. Hmm. I'm mispronouncing his first name. Um, but uh, uh, an Armenian mystic uh, who really combined Christianity and Sufism. Uh, 
and believe that that human beings could go on a sort of spiritual journey. It was very much it really Gurdjieff's teachings were very much what he tried to implement uh, in traditionalism years later. Mm -hmm. um, but Gurdjieff was, you know, was teaching you know, through Sufi dances, through 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 physical movement, through discipline, um, that people could awaken themselves to to a new world of spiritual truth and, and spiritual existence. And for Bannon, it wasn't just that he was into that, mm -hmm. you know, that he read those books and learned about it, but he actually was socializing and associating on the basis of it. And at a fairly early period of time, and I, I was able to confirm that with other people he was, he was meeting with. Mm -hmm. But this is, this is early 90s um, at the latest that he was doing mm -hmm. this sort of stuff. So he has that interest in alternative spirituality that predates his interest in politics, that predates some of his business and business dealings, his workings in Hollywood, um, all this, this career of his that is so capricious and so gimmicky in some sense, is so dilettantish. It does have a red thread. One thing that was consistent, and it's this, this right. is his interest in alternative spirituality. He's into that. And then really you get into the 2000s, I think. And that's when he be, really becomes much more of a right winger. And then he discovers that spirituality and right-wing politics actually meet and mix in Julius Evola, this traditionalist who's much more reactionary, and then also in Alexander Dugan. Mm -hmm. so, Interesting. And then secret, you know, in, in more closed settings, he starts uh, affiliating himself with traditionalism. With Josh Green, before I wrote my book, you know, asked him, well, you know, where's your, where's your political guide you know, what, what, who are you politically? And he mentions Rene Gunon, um, mm. this early traditionalist thinker, patriarch, I'd say. Mm. Interesting. Interesting term patriarch as well, because it sounds like it is very much based, you know, that hierarchical idea of, of authority and, and, and yeah. order and structure that, that seems to be so, so highly desired. Um, I've got to ask you as well, Ben, about in, in the chapter in your book, I believe it's a chapter, The Jedi Master, it's called, you you write about what is this is when you're trying to figure out what is the earliest mention of, of Steve Bannon's involvement in traditionalism, and you talk about a, an interview or a presentation of his that you see, where he's presenting a night a, a vision of a nightmare. What is that nightmare that that Steve Bannon presents? Um, this is when he's speaking to the Vatican uh, conference. Yes, um, he was speaking. Uh, about uh, militant Islam. He was speaking about uh, globalist capitalism um, that no longer could be controlled or contained by the people who were subject to it, let's say citizens of nations, because the political instrument that exists for a citizen, namely the nation, um, had become feeble um, and mm -hmm. had been so subordinated by, by global capitalism uh, that it really didn't matter what government was in place that, you know, international forces, actors, corporations, uh, stooges would, would be in a position to override the, the will of a government. And then, and then you find yourself in some sort of totalitarian situation where, where um, international capitalism uh, contains you. And he was speaking to a conservative audience. So this was his way actually of, of, of demonstrating his opposition to libertarianism, which is mm. otherwise kind of you know the popular alternative for um, for dissenters in especially Anglo-American conservatism, yeah. right? If you're really hardcore, let's say the Tea Party, you're a libertarian. That's how you show show your colors. And he was saying, no, I'm not. Guess what? I'm I'm a right winger and I'm not a libertarian. Mm. Uh, so it was in that context when he uh, he also started to talk about. Russia, and he talked about Putin, and then he mentioned an advisor that Putin had. He doesn't name this advisor by name, but he said that Putin has an advisor who harkens back to Julius Evola, who is a part of the traditionalist school. Mm -hmm. um, and and Bannon is pretty sloppy there when he's yes. talking. He 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 mixes things up, and that is true of him in all times and in all ways. Um, but he he affiliates this advisor to Putin with with. Julius Evola notes the, the politically incendiary nature of Julius Evola, talks about fat traditionalism as having, quote, metastasized into fascism, which is, which is not historically accurate, but he, he acknowledges that as politically reactionary and extreme. Mm -hmm. um, and then he ends up 
saying it when we get the final final round of everything that that the traditional school needs to be paid attention to in some ways and and also that putin perhaps is not quite the the threat to the west that the west seemed at that time convinced that he was mm. Um, now that advisor is not really an official advisor to Putin. Bannon kind of messed that up as well, but who he was talking about was Alexander Dugan. Hmm. Um, that's who he's referring to, the, the person who harkens back to, to Avila. And it, that was 2014. Um, and, you know, well before he is going to get in contact with, with Dugan, but already right then you could see he, a, a couple of things. He knew that, that these ideas and these people were controversial and could get him in trouble. But he also wanted to, acknowledging that, turn around and say, but guess what? There's something here that I like. And, and I don't think that we should um, put up a wall in the face of these, these people and these ideas. Mm. It's very interesting, isn't it? Because when, when I, I listen to, to Dugan speak, he speaks against what he calls unipolarity and this idea of, of American global hegemony. And he talks about, uh, is it multipolarity, if I'm not mistaken, where he talks about kind of the Russia's got the East and America can have the West or, or something something similar to that, not exactly that, but but the idea that there are these kind of sovereign power centres and it, it's not just America being the world police, so to speak. Yes, absolutely. And, it, and it, it, that can be two poles or it can be more. The important thing for him is that is to... From the second you go from one superpower to more than one, you degrade the idea or, or the claim that that one superpower has on the future of the world. Mm. So it's not just the United States, but liberalism in, in Alexander Dugan's mind, the belief that the belief in progress, mm. um, that we are always going to be in a process of throwing off oppression and making our lives better than they mm. were, and that we are pr proceeding from a past of ignorance to a future of enlightenment. Mm. Um, those, those liberal democratic ideals, he sees as, as thanks to the military and economic power of the United States becoming, you know, being seen as destiny for the entire world. And if, and if they're contained, if they're pushed back just a small amount, suddenly they can't have that status of being everybody's future, of being mm. the universal future. So, you know, when, when you're getting into the details of, well, does Dugan want to see the United States versus Russia or in multiple polls? And it, he would tell you at a metaphysical level, it almost doesn't matter. Hmm. The important thing is that the monopoly of the West, not just militarily, politically or economically, but metaphysically, spiritually, philosophically, if it is pulled away from being universal, that's a difference of kind rather than degree. Right at that, it's no longer universal, and and universality is one of these principles that traditionalists do not like. It's mm. it's represented in the idea of of the, of the caste hierarchy, that mm. there are boundaries, there are there are differences, and there is not complete uniformity in society, um, vertically or horizontally. Mm. That's so, interesting. Yeah, and I and I think I think you can see how some of that resonates with with a, a political campaign like Trump's, this America first, this isolationist nationalist uh, view of the world that we need to, we need to retrench American global power. Mm -hmm. um, you know, do not intervene in Syria because Syria's destiny is Syria's destiny. Yeah. Um, in Afghanistan, we need to pull out of it because they, they get to be meaningfully different from us if they mm -hmm. want to. Mm -hmm. um, and if they aren't democratic, if they are oppressive toward women, that's their thing. <laughs> Who right. are we and on what grounds do we pacify them to be like us? Well, it's, it's only if we think that our values are universal. Mm. Right. Interesting. So, um, so, yeah, all of these, yeah, we haven't, got, we haven't talked that much about the ways that populism and traditionalism can overlap, um, aside from the stylistic discussions of magic and you know dock workers and things like that but um <laughs> there, there's a lot of there's a lot of conceptual overlap in fact um the, yeah you know, among those ideas yeah so so how does that look then ben in terms of in terms of how do, how does all this look how does it all fit together in terms of these practical applications in politics as, as Bannon sees it you can get a, a i think a, 
right wing traditionalists can can go a great distance with the standard political programs of Trump, let's say, or mm. Bolsonaro, despite the fact that they're officially populist and they're speaking to the you know the working classes as mm. opposed to elites in a society. Um, there is there there can be a question of what happens after a period of destruction. Now, mind mm. you, again, traditionalists looking at this dark age um, yearn for a certain type of destruction. They can think of that in different ways, but the belief is, is that, well, if you break apart these massive entities, the European Union, the US federal government, mm. you know, the, the unipolar world, the world government, um, global capitalism, um, that if you break them apart, in their place, you will see smaller structures, a more siloed, isolated, segmented world, and that that will be better in some way. Mm -hmm. um, it's not always the case that populists think that way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some their populism in its own way can coexist with American imperialism. Yes. In the US. Um, so, it, you know, they some supporters of Trump will say, okay, go in and destroy the federal government and tear down all the excess money in Washington um, and by the way, make our military stronger and greater than it's ever been. Trump has said that, you know, make it the yeah. best, most incredible so we control the whole world. That's suddenly then you have, you've started on a path with a traditionalist and veered in a different direction. Mm. Um, and, and also let's say, um, some versions of right-wing conservatism, like libertarianism, they can sympathize with traditionalists. Uh, so long as they are opposing the U.S. federal government and want to want to break it apart, mm. in some way, they diverge after that that rupture would take place. Though, at least in their visions of, of the future, where where a libertarian would not want to see, would want to see a more hyper individualistic society, mm -hmm. replacing a collective represented by the state. Traditionalists do not like individualism. They do not like the chaos of it. They don't like mm. the progressive nature notion of individuals and being able to just do whatever you want mm. um, and take no care for the collective or for history or things like that so they would want to see probably some new edifice replace uh, some new entity replace the u.s federal government that would still assert collectivity still have some strength in a collective whereas the libertarian is going to be thinking in entirely different paths yeah so I, I can go much further with this. I know we're, we're running short on time here, Tom, but uh, all of this is to say that in a lot of right-wing causes, as in, as in all complex political um, uh, maneuvering, you have a number of interests coming together and they can come together for a certain period of time or for a certain part of a trajectory. And traditionalists are... are among them and they can actually ride along with populism for quite a while mm. but it's, if populism matures if populism were to achieve its goals then we might see some tension and then we might see those those various factions of it coming into conflict with one another mm. yes all, all sorts of fault lines that, that are between these things and it's interesting you make the point about collectivism and individuality that, that's really interesting because Oftentimes we, we look at that as, as in, in the current state of play, we look at that as East versus West at the moment in the political structures, not necessarily the philosophical structures, but certainly when you look at China and, and America and, and what's going on there, it's very, very dichotomous in, in that respect. Absolutely. And I mean, this was Dugan. So Dugan and Bannon met and they disagreed about China in particular. And for Dugan, the Chinese state is a representation of the collective, mm. right? The, the CCP, the Communist Party, their willingness to assert the force of the state in his mind shows a prioritization of the collective and the whole opposite the individual. Bannon doesn't, doesn't read the Chinese state as being anything like that. He thinks it's a, tre it's a treacherous um, oppressor and totalitarian rather than some manifestation of the whole and the collective. Um, but, but they each, you know, feel compelled to comment on that because they both also represent, they both also feel some animosity towards individualism. Yeah. Um, you know, which Dugan defines the United States as being essentially individualistic and liberal for at least for most of his career, he might be changing about that. Whereas Bannon, we spoke about this too, looks at the United States as being something more than its 
its Enlightenment era foundational documents and civic, secular, um, political values. He mm. thinks that the United States actually has a sort of collective essence and inheritance that predates and supersedes all of those things. Mm. So, Ben, this has been a fascinating conversation and so many, we, we could go on for hours and hours, except we can't. That's, that's the only problem. Um, one, thing, one thing that's interesting to me is I recently spoke with Ronald Biner, the political scientist at Toronto University, and he wrote on the dangers of, of Nietzsche and Heidegger as thinkers in relation to the rise of the far right. He yes. said that Trump's out of power, but Trumpism is not dead, and that he's praying that we're not living through another Weimar moment. What do you think about the current state of play? Do you think we're in a, another Weimar moment or? I, I'm not gonna use those words because history is not gonna repeat itself quite in that way. Um, I, here, here's, here's what I see. Not 2020 Trump, but 2016 Trump, the Trump that also happened to be electorally successful, mm -hmm. did touch upon a vulnerability in the political spectrum across the West, and it's been capitalized on more in Europe than it has in the United States, that namely the combination of socially conservative positions and values with let's say more protectionist economic policies. Um, I've spoken to some, some young uh, Republicans, let's say like some up and coming leaders in, in that party who are entirely convinced that if they, um, are to the right of the current Republican Party on social issues, let's say to the right of Mitt Romney, and mm. to the left of the Democratic Party on economics, that they could blow up the political spectrum and rule for a generation. Mm. Um, seen something like that in Trump's share, the fact that he won in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, the United States, the fact that he carved into the old left coalition, um, made him made him very formidable. And what we're seeing in Europe in many cases is that the populist right is succeeding with uh, with with old social democrat voters, right? Mm -hmm. Rural labor, labor left. And when and when they start to do that, if they do it effectively, they're they're very difficult to stop. So I see, I see something like that taking place in in the in the US political context. If that's Trumpism, I don't, I don't know. I'm not really sure what that word means. Hmm. Uh, it, but, but Trump did introduce that that idea back into American political discourse in a way that it hadn't been before. Um, it hadn't been there before, and you get a more, uh, let's, uh, a more consistent sort of um, pre-enlightenment nationalism, romantic. Uh, or, or as some scholars derisively call it, Eastern nationalism, than what we're used to seeing in the United States, where suddenly the role of government is to look at the population that exists here um, and, and just protect it, not just economically, but also in terms of its identity um, and in terms of, of conservative social values. I could see something like that coming and being, being very, very difficult for the left as it's currently constituted in the United States to stop. Mm. Very interesting. Ben Teitelbaum, thank you so much for your time. A pleasure being with you, Tom. Thanks for chatting.